This is Angela Tipton from FireYourCareer.com, and you are listening to Vroom Vroom Vreer with Jeff Smith, reminding you to live life on your terms. Well done. I'm keeping that one. I Sounds good to the, me. I might keep the first one too, but we'll see. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> what, whatever works. Whatever you can works. Use whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Cool. Let me hit stop. I'll be right back. Great. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Evan Roth, thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Veer and welcome to the show. How's it going? It's going great. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for being here. And uh, sorry you're having another another sneezy day there in uh, SoCal. <laughs> but we'll get through it. <laughs> uh, it's here and it's breezy where you are with those Breezy palm trees. Yeah. Well, I'm actually in Las Vegas and uh, I think our allergy season is over. Thank God. <laughs> it was extra this year. Both my uh, wife and I were you know, typically, you know, it's a pretty short pollen season here in Vegas, but we had a lot of rain uh, in the winter and the spring. So we were both very, uh, lots of allergy uh, action for us this year spring but it's pretty much over thank god so hope hopefully you'll get there soon so you are kevin roth you're at kevinroth.org so talk a little bit about what you're most excited about your website your business etc at all well you know i've been a musician playing the dulcimer uh, my whole life right and made a lot of records and um you know had my taste of a little fame a little fortune right and and in 2016, um, I became a life coach. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And so I became a life coach consultant. Um, and when I got into that business, you know, people were advising me and said, well, you know, you need a niche because there's 10,000 life coaches. So what's your specific niche? And I was saying, well, I created something called Dulce Meditation. Okay. Oh, no. So I use the dulcimer and I uh, do personalized meditations and I put some stuff up on my YouTube channel. Okay. And uh, so I'm excited about that. And I will also teach a form of spirituality, but kind of make fun of uh, the heaviness that everyone has around religion and spirituality. I Thanks for created that. a pup <laughs> called Guru. Huh? Thanks for that. I checked out the guru. He's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I so wish much. he could show up today, but it's uh, it's audio only, and without the puppet on video, I don't think it would be half as fun. <laughs> right, just, yeah. so, uh, so I try and just have fun, and I have some great clients, and I'm always creating and living the life here in Southern California. Yeah, and you're somewhere around San Diego, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. San Diego's great. So I lived in uh, the L.A. area around Torrance, South Bay, for yeah. longer than I wanted to. But we went to like uh, San Diego quite a bit for shopping and fun and yeah. great college town, really good food. Yeah. LA's uptight. San Diego's laid back. Yes. So laid back. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's nice. And where I live, I only live about a 10 minute at most. It's really more like a five minute drive to the ocean oh, where wow. I walk along the beach uh, most every day. And then I'm only about two hours from the mountains. That's so, perfect. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, you've, it's, got, it's, you've got it going on. <laughs> I, so in 2017, we moved from SoCal to Vegas, mostly just to save money. I got tired of paying California state tax. Um, right. But we still go back. I mean, several times a year, we drive over to Torrance and, and just hang out. My wife is addicted to selling Japanese books on eBay. So she's oh. from Japan. So we go and scour the, uh, uh, well, she sends out like notes saying, Hey, I'm going to be in LA. Does anybody want to sell me a bunch of old books? 
And so that's one way we go to libraries, we go to like uh, savers, um, goodwills, and then she takes those books and sells them on eBay after she reads them. Now, she doesn't read them all. <laughs> the what's what the palm trees are hiding behind me is uh, uh, packing material for her eBay hobby that's getting bigger and bigger and taking over the house. But anyway, I digress. Whenever I leave California, I think, why did I ever leave? It's awesome. <laughs> So let's go back in time and talk about Kevin Roth. So where did you grow up? What part of the country did you grow up in? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. So completely different than uh, SoCal? Very different. Yeah. And the East Coast vibe is completely different. (laughs) Extremely different. Couldn't be more different. You have an East Coast vibe. You have a South vibe, Southern vibe, like New Orleans. Right. Down there. Yeah. Midwest definitely has its own vibe. Totally. That's where I grew up. I grew up in Michigan. So, yeah, yeah I get so, it. Very uptight. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I lived in Kansas for a year and a half. I didn't find them uptight, but I found them closed. Closed. That's a good word. Yeah. You know, they're, they're emotionally or ex- in terms of expression, they're closed. Where right. here in California, people are very wide open. Right. You know, yeah, so it, for sure. it's nice. And then, of course, the upper part of the states they're just um uh, breed into themselves <laughs> it's true yes uh, but you know there's even a difference between la people and here totally you know oh, yeah. la people um i don't know how do i put this being in the entertainment business well they're full of shit <laughs> basically <laughs> And, and yes. you know, they're out for something, and I get it. That's that kind of town, and that's exactly why I don't go to L- L.A. Right. No, yes. So I, 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 don't I get date, it. I get it. Yeah, Especially Hollywood, people. L.A. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I won't date anybody from there or, no, you know. No, good call. Everything with caution. And, yeah. Um, I just, I've never had a great experience with hanging out um uh, well, romantically in LA, it's not a town for me. Yeah, <clears throat> but um, I couldn't do LA. I don't even like driving through it. No, no I hate <laughs> it. <laughs> traffic, I hate it. And people, when you live in anywhere near LA, and then they say, "I'm going to come," I'm, I'll be in LA, and they come yeah. to visit you. They're going to be like in the valley, and I'm in South Bay. That's like that's not the yeah. same place. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. a two-hour drive. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, do, I do drive up to Ohio on occasion or Ohio's go up great. to West yeah. Coast and things like that. Central so. California is nice. As soon as you get like over, what is that? What do they call the uh, the mountain range? And then when you're done with it, you're like around Oxnard. It's got a pineapple yeah. something or other. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I like driving up the, the coast because from San Diego all the way up through... Um, Oh, I don't know. Just keep going north and you hit the coastal highway, which is yes. just yeah, gorgeous. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. So what but, what's Philadelphia like? Uh it, because I get like mixed signals. Like I, I hear all th- all kinds of things about Philly fans. Uh <laughs> did you get well, into never that been at sport, all? Okay. Never been a sports guy, but Philly was um I liked it when I lived there. Of course I only lived there till I was about thirteen. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But, um I would go back there. Uh, you know, we moved a little farther. I think West or we moved out to the country, but Philly at the time had a great downtown city. It right. wasn't filled with crime like it is now. And there were little pockets you could go to like, um, uh, Chinatown, which is open all night long, which is great. Nice. And there was the Italian market, right. which is amazing. Wow. And the art museums and, uh, the food. And I liked Philly, you know, it, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it, it was a friendly place. Um, I even liked New York when I had to go there. I found people in New York very friendly when sure. you spoke to them. Sure. Um, and uh, I liked the East Coast. The only thing I didn't like was the snow and the ice. <laughs> I'm with you. That was my major motivation to get out of yeah. Michigan and only visit, you know, occasionally. The weather yeah. is not great. But I have friends that say, well, God, don't you want to travel you know, you can travel. And I say, you know, I've got almost everything I want here in Southern California. Right. I don't want 
I've been a little bit of traveling. You know, I've, of course, I've done a lot in the United States with concert tours, but right. I've been to Paris and Amsterdam. But um, uh, I, I'm there's so much to see in Southern California I haven't even gotten to. Right. It's huge. Yeah, you're right. It's so, awesome. Yeah. So, okay. So, like, when, the, let's talk about, like, say, did you go to college? Because <laughs> you <know, laughs> you're a musician, I, uh, so it's not required, right? <laughs> I was, no, I was doing a benefit uh, performance at Peter, Paul, and Mary's bass player, Richard Kniss, uh Memorial. Okay. And I was on stage, and uh, I said to the audience, uh, Peter and <clears throat> Paul were in the audience, Mary had passed away by that point. But I said that people always ask me, where did I go to college? And I tell them the truth. I'm a graduate of the University of Peter, Paul and Mary. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm a graduate of the life school of, uh, yeah. No, so what I did is I, I spent my money learning um, voice. I studied voice at Bryn Mawr Conservatory. Oh, wow privately and the rest I spent on psychoanalysis. <laughs> so that was my education. <laughs> Wait a minute, were were you the analyst or the uh, the client? Oh no, I was the client. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. I just wanted to make yeah. sure cuz you can no, spend no. money great, on both sides. <laughs> I I love therapy. I love a good therapist. I had I worked with her for a long time. She she told me at the end of our time together she said I had she had to re-raise me which wasn't surprising, but I have clients who are psychotherapists and I have clients, I've had clients who were ministers and doctors. I have them from all over the place and therapists are, I think the funniest and the craziest. I bet. Right. Yeah. 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 But well, I, they're I, taking I, on everybody else's baggage a lot of times, right? You have no, to have you a strategy for that, I think. Yeah. I don't take on any of my clients' stuff. I right. make them, I make them laugh through it, but I, I'm a, I make them accomplish things. Um, but I always thought psychotherapists were just people that, you know, well, there were people like me. If I wasn't a musician, I would have easily gone into psychotherapy. I love the analytical. I love it as an artist, as a writer. Right. And I, I just loved, I love therapy. It, and I never thought of it as therapy. I just thought of it as a different way of looking at things. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we all come from screwed up families to one degree or another and totally, yeah. so you don't know Nobody what comes what. out of childhood unscathed as they say. <laughs> yeah. 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 So when a therapist tells you, you know, that is inappropriate behavior by your parent and you look at them like they're what, well, what do you mean? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Especially you know, our so, generation, you know, I don't know how yeah. old you are, but I'm 55. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we didn't question much. <laughs> so when my, we were my, kids, he, right? Yeah, so I didn't go to a college. Um, ironically, right after high school, I taught at a college, the New England okay. Conservatory of Music. I taught the dulcimer during oh, that's winter. that's great. Yeah, so my education has been more street learning. So did I was you... into my, Yeah, I was into my music career way too. I, my first record came out when I was 16, so oh, I was wow. already into a career. I wasn't into the college thing. So you learned how to sing and play dulcimer at a very young age then. Yeah. 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 Played piano by ear when I was a young kid. And, um, I was very, uh, spiritually, um, driven. Interesting. In the sense that I realized when I was really, really young that this world didn't make any sense. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so I had to. Most people ask. have to go through a lot of shit to get there. <laughs> well, yeah. I did. <laughs> well, you know, I found out I, you know, it didn't make any sense that, uh, you know, we were spinning around the sun at six hundred miles an hour or whatever it is, and and uh, so I, I would ask, um, you know, people who had quote higher education, and they would say, well. That's, you know, how, how does the moon stay up there and doesn't crash into the earth or whatever? And they say, well, that's a science question. And when I asked science, they said, well, no, what you're really asking is religion. So then I would ask religious people uh, why and how and all this came about. And they said, well, 
God created the heavens and earth in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. And I said, well, well that's stupid. I mean, it's God. <laughs> so they didn't like that. And then I went to psychics and astrologers. I made friends with them, and they, they told me things about my life which they couldn't possibly have known, and I was intrigued with that. And then eventually I just came to the conclusion that this whole thing is a real dream. It's just right. an illusion. So that that's what I teach. I teach kind of a non-duality kind of a thing. I love it. Yeah. 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 I got there. Uh, see, I love it when you know something has a little bit more, I don't know how to say this, like, like a, I don't want to say true because everybody, that's a loaded word. How about true for me? A mm -hmm. personal truth, right? Yeah. Is it's like, yeah, uh, everybody, there's a lot of, uh, cooperation in the spiritual literature about how this life is very dreamlike or illusion and all those things. Right. So when I hear that, yeah, like I agree, you know, even the people like uh, Elon Musk talking about, Oh, we're probably living in a computer simulation. I'm like, kind of, but not really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, everybody has their own opinions. I did a YouTube right. video a couple of weeks ago and it's called I asked God who he was and what I was shown blew my mind. Ooh, okay. Good tell. It had, it's gotten over 83,000 views. 83,000. Yeah. In less than three weeks. Wow. Uh, and this is my, a YouTube video. Yeah. And my subscriptions went up by almost 2000 so far. Right. Wow. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because I spoke about my own personal experience. Right. And there were so many people who commented that they too have had the same questions and the same experience. And then there were a lot of people who were quoting the Bible at me. Sure. And I thought to myself, what did I say that would create them to tell me you're being led by the devil and you don't know what you're talking about? So I went back and I watched the the tape, which I don't usually do. I watch it once. Okay. And there was absolutely nothing I had said on there, uh, which would indicate anything that I would say, uh, well, if you believe Jesus is your savior, you're crazy. I never said anything like that. I said, whatever you believe. And I think I mentioned Jesus or Muhammad or whatever. Right. Varying different viewpoints, but it was fascinating because I've had over I don't know, 600 comments or something like that on, on it. I think that's how many. Um, and there were so many varying uh, viewpoints on spirituality and religion. And um, I was really shocked at, at the, uh, the response. So I think anytime you put something in a title, like I spoke to God or I want to know about God, or you're going to get religious people and spiritual people. It's a, it's a great clickbait thing. I didn't yes. realize when I, when I did it. <laughs> That's exactly. You, know? you accidentally made some click clickbaitable uh, content, as the kids would say. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was a pretty good video, I thought, you know, but it really stirred things up. Right. So for a lot of people, um, way more positive than negative. I don't usually get negative comments, but and these weren't negative from the born, the really hardcore Christians. Anyway, so I made another video right after that. Okay. Talked about, um, basically the theme of it was, don't shove the Bible in, in my face. Just act like Jesus did. Okay. Don't preach to me. I like that. And of course, that didn't get as many views. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you didn't get the clickbait right, right? <laughs> Uh, I don't really go so much to clickbait, but yeah, uh, it's it, it interesting. So the viewpoint of where science and spirituality meet are almost at the same place. Totally. Yeah. So right, but you right. have to see that and, and understand that. And then you realize this whole thing is a, a, an illusion and things like that. I, I'm, I'm loving all of that. Um, I'm currently binging. Have you ever heard of this guy? He's a neuroscientist at Stanford, uh, Andrew Huberman. He's got a podcast and, Basically, you can just, I went, I'm, I've got this habit of when I get into a thing, I go back to podcast episode one um, uh, and just binge. <laughs> and then when I get bored, I go find the next thing. But oh my goodness, he's just, it's like getting a, a Stanford neuroscience degree very slowly. You know, he's just like, 
professing about like neuroscience and I've learned so much. It's just amazing. You know, a lot of these things that you learn about in spiritual texts, I'm not saying it's despiritualizing or demystifying. It is a little, but even if you believe it, or whatever you believe or don't believe, um, it's got to come through our bodies, right? And neuroscientists are trying to figure out mechanism. That's what he's doing. That's, yeah. That's the problem. That's, okay. That's the problem. Because you want to get into this? I do. Uh, yeah, please. Well, yeah, tell okay, me. So here, here's how it works. So people like Deepak Chopra and all of these other people, they, they say everything basically comes down to consciousness. Okay. Everything is consciousness. Right. So here's some facts. The mind doesn't exist. Right. If you cut open your brain, you can't take out a mind. You can't physically hold something called right. a mind. Right. You can't also physically see or touch or hear or speak to something physical called an ego. Right. So what are all these things? So they call this the hard question and call it consciousness. So then the question is, okay, well, what is consciousness? Right. Well, you can call it God or benevolence or whatever you want, Jesus or whatever you want to call it. Right. So non-duality says, basically in a nutshell, that everything is one thing. Right. Source. Sure. And everything that happens within this dream experience is that doing what it does. Right. So this conversation is is that doing what it does. There is. <laughs> but the problem with non-duality is that it's not conclusive right to me so i had a wonderful friend and teacher named robert wolf robert wolf okay w-o-l-f-e and he was in ojai and he taught non-duality and i went up after i knew him for six years i knew him until he passed away and uh he was very well respected uh teacher very low-key uh, if, you, if you want to read some some great stuff, you look up Robert Wolf. Yeah, books. Or Ramana, Ramana Maharshi, of course. Okay. But So I went up to a meeting in Ojai, a non-duality meeting, and I asked everybody at the table, I said, okay, I get that everything is one thing, but what do you do with it? Right. So everything is God. So, all right, great. But now what? Yes, the now what question. Now what? Okay, fine. Now what? <laughs> so... He took me back to his apartment afterwards, and he said, I'm going to introduce you to something else, and it's called Ajata, A-J-A-T-A, -A -A, which is sounds like Sunyata, which okay. in Buddhism, it means that um, basically Ajata is that nothing's ever come into creation, nothing has been born, nothing dies, there's no teacher, there's nothing, emptiness. Right. Okay, complete emptiness. So that clicked with me because that's what I sense as a small boy, that whatever there was or wasn't uh, is not describable. Right. It just is. Yes. The problem with that is that in the dream experience, um, the mind wants to know. Sure. What does God look yeah, like? Because a jada, yeah. I, yeah, a jada cancels everything out. A jada cancels itself out. So in a jada, it basically, which is the ultimate truth, uh, according to uh, Ramana Maharshi, who I think is one of the great spiritual teachers for real, um, you don't exist. None of this exists. And the idea of God is simply an idea. doesn't mean that whatever it is doesn't exist, because I believe that there, at least in my own sense, there certainly is something. Right. Whatever that is, I don't know. But that's, that, that's hard to name, right? Yeah, but <laughs> and thing, language fails. Yes, I get it. This is why I tell my clients when they give me the deer in the headlights look, I said, why do you need to know what it is? The, the issue is that your mind wants to know because you want to validate things, but your mind doesn't exist. Your ego doesn't exist. You don't exist except within the dream experience. And so the... The analogy I use, and I write about this in, in my in my book, Between the Notes, which is available on Amazon. Um, <laughs> really good. I, I like, I, like I, say, I say that life is like you go to a movie, and the screen is always permanent. You right. sit in the movie, and what's projected on the screen is the movie. Right. And you get all caught up in the movie, whether it's the Titanic going down, or the fire, or murder, or love. 
and your, your, your endorphins and all your physiological stuff happens in your blood and the chemical, blah, 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 and then you leave. Right. So your life is like a movie. It's just a projection on the screen, but the real thing is the screen. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good analogy. So the problem is, is that we get caught up in the movie of our life. Right. And we think that this is major. So earlier, you and I were talking about money, right? Right. So I thought many years ago, if I just had a million dollars, right, or if I just had a lot of fame, or if I, blah, 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 I'd be happy, and it was bullshit. I got all that, and it wasn't. Right. Totally. <laughs> so what makes you happy? And right. you think that the most important thing is to realize that this is just a dream, a, a very temporary experience. And you can watch things like near-death experiences, which is one of my favorite things to watch on YouTube and hear what people who have supposedly died come back and say. Right. And, and they say the same thing. Everything is this one beautiful energy. Right. And um, it's no it's usually good news. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, some people experience certain things. And right. You won't know um, until you have it, if you have it. Right. But if there's no you to have it, there's no problem. Right. So no mind, no problem. Right, right. Yes. Uh, I, this reminds me of a, a – have you ever heard of um, – now I'm going to get this wrong Cor – Jack Cornfield. I've heard of him. Yeah, he's a spiritual teacher and he's also a scientist. And um, he was talking to Tim Ferriss on his podcast. Mm -hmm. And he likes to talk about like um, in story a lot like what you're doing right now. And um, I think he said like when it comes to these – questions about like what is reality what the hell is going on right you're either going to need a really big good story i.e a religion or a philosophy or whatever or nothing at all <laughs> and tim comes back and says what's nothing at all and he says just that it's absolutely nothing because that is as far as we can tell the truth is nothing yes <laughs> And people just can't wrap their brain around that. That's why they make up these stories, I think. Yeah, but I think everyone knows that it, that it is whatever it is if you just have silence just for a little bit and you listen to right. the inner voice, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's still a small voice, right. yes. Yeah. But you have to be careful who your teachers are with this stuff. Um, you know, I was just watching a YouTube video of a quite a well-known non-dual teacher who – just said that he was giving up non-duality because of whatever, whatever, whatever. And I thought, you can't give up non-duality. <laughs> like, oh sure he can. He's just, he's just going to put a new thing in that space that says, what the F? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, what, you can do that as long as lots of people are doing that. Right? Well, what he replaced it with is, I want to feel the emotional experience of life. I want to live. I want to stop stamping out and muting my life i'm not living full and uh, dude that's just the dream right just the dream there's yeah, the yeah. reality and there's the dream you're right. in the dream right. so have fun with the dream yeah exactly you're in a play right have fun right yeah don't say i'm quitting the play you can't quit the play <laughs> no no i learned it's that the funny. hard way and there's no play anyway so it's it's that's why i like ramana maharshi right as a the teacher and Robert Wolf, and then I, you know, I, I teach it just based on what I, I know, but um, I teach it like you and I are talking. I don't have these little satsangs. Right, right, right. You just with flowers. Chat. <laughs> yeah. Chat. Some, yeah, some, some people, there was a, I think someone on the God uh, video said, you know, I can tell you are an enlightened being. And, you know, I've been, I've been asked, am I, am I enlightened? And I kind of chuckle when people ask me that. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a ludicrous question, I think. <laughs> well, I, I think I know certain things for a time being, but uh, no, I'm not an enlightened being and don't sit at my feet. And right. Chill. Yeah. If yeah. it means something to you, then probably no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Probably no. So let's talk about this, how you got over your death sentence. In 2015, oh, that. because that was, it sounds like it was kind of close to uh, the 2016, you become a spiritual teacher or sorry, sorry, right. life coach, life coach. So when I moved to Kansas, um, 
my sister lived in Kansas, so I was moving to be kind of closer to her. Um, I got diagnosed uh, with melanoma. Right. Um, so One they of the re- most popular cancers that people get. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, a lot of people get it. It's yeah. very dangerous. It is. My dad and, had some uh, melanoma, so I get it. It's scary. Yeah. So I had it the, the little spot removed, and then I thought that was I was done with it. Um, actually, they didn't even think it was melanoma. They thought it was precancerous, so they called it, um, what do they call it? In situ. Okay. So then something else showed up, and they biopsied it, and they found out that it, I actually had stage three melanoma. There's only four stages. So checking around for oncologists, <clears throat> three of which I, I just didn't like, and the fourth one I did, the advice was that there's no cure. This was like nine or ten years ago for my type of melanoma. Right. There are different types. And that basically, um, even though they removed the little lymph node where it was, it hadn't spread anywhere, but they said that there was a 70% chance it would come back within two years and I'd be dead. That's not good so, odds. I don't like 70%. That doesn't sound no, good. Not, no, not. But uh, I didn't believe them in my gut. I didn't think that that was true and it ended up not being true. Oh, good. I, I questioned why I had gotten cancer, and cancer really comes from stress and inflammation and all kinds of other things. Right. And I was, had been very, very stressed out, and I was pretty much overweight at that point. And I said, I got to make a, I got to get out of this lane and find another one. Right. So I thought, well, what kind of life do you want to live? And I said, you know, I want to live in Southern California like a bohemian and uh, do what the hell I want. And that's it. Love it. So I moved to California after a year. I went to my oncologist and uh, I said, um, I'm out of here. It hasn't come back that we know of. And I moved to Southern California and recreated my life. In fact, I wrote an album about it called The Deviant Dulcimerous, which has some really great songs on it. Yeah, uh, there's, the, there's the turkey that was ate cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> Fed cannabis. I love it. That was great. <laughs> the incredible likeness of being is, a, is a sort of an autobiographical song about that journey from here to there. And then one day someone said, you know, you should teach people how you got through what you do, what you went through. Right. Okay. Because uh, at that point I had lost a lot of money. I wasn't in the music business. I was sort of lost. I'd hit an abyss, but I climbed out of it. And um, he said, you should be a life coach. So I began to look into it, and it was somewhat appealing. But then COVID came. Oh, okay. And COVID was a really godsend for me because California paid your rent, and they paid your food, and they gave you money. I had a chance to develop the business, and there was no lack of people who were stressed out. Mm, Right. So began to do it and found out I was pretty good at it and liked it and uh, was making really good money at it and was using music as part of it. Yeah. Uh, That's where I became the life coach. That's amazing. That's amazing. So what did you do to heal your body? So did you just like, or just walk through it? Well, the first thing I did when I was diagnosed with cancer is I walked through my apartment and I said out loud, don't worry, buddy, we'll get through this, which told me that I had someone inside me that was my friend, which I hadn't realized. That's a, that's, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then the second thing is I cursed out God and I said, and they're uh, doing that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I asked myself three questions. What do you want? What don't you want? Uh, what are you going to do about it? Okay. Basically. Right. Uh, and I said, I'm going to go to California, and this is the life that I envision. This is who I am. And I walked into it. I didn't say, well, in 14 months. I, I said, no, no, no. Right now, this is who I am. Wow. And I looked for an apartment. And I couldn't. I called a friend in San Diego, and he said, you only want to spend 1000 a month. You can't 
maybe you'll rent a room. I said, no, I want a place by the beach and yada, yada, yada with parking and all this stuff, which is a joke here in San Diego. Yeah. But I kept calling around and I found one and it was just coming up and it was going to be for a thousand. She gave me a deal on it and I moved into my new life. Wow. So what I teach people is how to do it. That's amazing. Yeah. So the first thing you have to know is what you don't want. Right. Yes. And then the second thing you need to know is what you do want. What and you actually you, want and then move towards yeah, it. You, yeah, you yeah. need a plan because right. you don't need much to be happy. No. I live in a very, you know, I've had homes with swim, you know, swimming pools and all that crap. Uh, well, it's not crap if you like it. In Florida where I was living, it was a nice thing to have. But I live in a 500 square foot one bedroom apartment, which I just really love. Mm. It's my dog. It's comfortable. Yeah, yeah. I'm surrounded by my own art. I sell my art to people. I have dulcimers. I've got a great dog. and It's a simple you know, life. Yeah, I'm relatively, really it's happy. A simple, mundane, happy existence. <laughs> I, You know, there's people don't value that, that it's like, I, I, I've been, I read another book recently. Um, and it, it really laid it out at Arthur C. Brooks. And I think it's something like uh, how to build a life worth living or build a life. Yeah. Right. And he wants everybody to be a happiness coach. But the point he, one of the points he makes that I really liked was beware of the false idols and um, you're probably familiar with some of these false idols. I think it's power, fame, money, um, those things. Like the the one thing that I haven't like figured out how to like. Comp so he says pleasure is like one of those false idols that you don't really want to let go of because then you can't have joy <laughs> so much. Right. Well, I, I think that it depends on who's looking at you and what they're looking at. You know, I, I told my sister recently, I I did a painting for her for her birthday. It was a kind of a copy of another painting that I'd done for a client. And I told her what the painting was worth, what I had sold that painting for. Right. Um, and that this was a gift, you know, but this is. And she said, who would pay you that kind of money? for a painting. And I said, someone who thinks that I'm important or someone who's a fan or someone who likes my artwork, right. you, I'm your brother. So it's like, Oh, he's an artist. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the kind of art I do is, is abstract and naive. So it looks like a child could do it. Right. People pay me a lot of money. That's People great. also pay me a great deal of money to talk to me. My sister can't figure that one out either. She says, well, I wouldn't pay you that unless you had a degree and you became a, a psychiatrist. You make more than a psychiatrist. I say, go talk to a psychiatrist. Don't talk to me. Right. <laughs> and I'm so, your brother. I, would, I wouldn't make a good psych or coach for you. <laughs> it's relationship yeah, so, dependent. Yes, I get it. Yeah, I had a little kid come to a kid's concert once I gave him. He came up with a record of mine, wanted an autograph, and he asked me, am I famous? And I said, have you ever heard of me before? And he said, no. I said, well, then I'm not. Right, right. It's, it's that simple, you know. So if, if you know, it <laughs> depends what's important, important to you. You know, if, right. if you've just filled your stomach with, if you ate any more food, you'd, you'd throw up. Right. If you took that person to a smorgasbord, that's the best smorgasbord in the world. They can't enjoy it at all, right. you know. Right. So it depends how you're looking at things and what you're looking for. And less right. is more, in my experience. Totally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm with you. The simple is, and it works. And I, you know, I don't know how much money I need to live. I mean, I get. I'm at the age where I get Social Security. Right. But I get Medicare, thank God. But um. What well, sounds like you have enough. <laughs> I don't know what enough is, but I have uh, I have more than I had. That's and a good answer. I like that. Yeah, more yeah, than you had. I have I, whatever I want. I can afford, but I don't want anything. I'm, I'm right. pretty, you know. I'm happy being being a bohemian schlemiel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, let's talk about like your music career because you've got some really cool. Um, music highlights here right so yeah. I, if you don't mind 
oh, go ahead. <laughs> So what what was this uh, kid show that you oh the shiny time station you right. sang the theme song and right. I didn't know what that was okay so I had to go look that up mm. and so that I think most people would say that's um that's the what that what's the tank the train's name um it's the tank engine there you go <laughs> but that wasn't the name of the show it was shiny time station. It was based on Thomas the Tank Engine. Yes. Okay, gotcha. So, how did that happen? Well, the producer of the show had put his daughter to bed every night with my lullaby for Little Dreamers album. Oh. They had okay. hired someone in New York to sing the theme, and I guess he blew it. And so he tracked me down, and he had me come to New York and have a meeting with him. And he said, I think this is going to be a big show. Ringo Starr is going to be the conductor. Right. And then it turned into George Carlin and some other people. And it was an instant hit on PBS. Right. And it catapulted my music career because... Um, well, you have a credit now. A big credit. And then right. I, could, I had my own record label at that point. So, you know, I made good good bucks getting my stuff distributed and made deals in the in the industry and... Nothing like a hit show, I'll tell you that. It's, <laughs> it's amazing, you know. Okay. And the thing, Tiny Time Station is bigger now on on the internet, you know, the cult following. It's, I think it was like 40 years ago, I think. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, this was, um, I was like, why don't I know anything about this? And then I looked at it. I was like, oh, it started in 1989. I was no longer a kid. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, right. So 89, I was already in the Air Force, right? So, okay. So I, when I heard about Thomas the Tank Engine, you know, it was, I was done with kids. I never had my own kids. So that's, it made sense why I was like, what the, what the F is that? <laughs> anyway, I missed it on the first time around. So, but yeah. then that got you other things. You, you worked with Sony Music, Random House, Time Warner, all things considered. So what did you do on All Things Considered? Did you do some... Oh, that was a little thing on my album, Unbearable Bears. So they did like a little five or ten minute segment on that album. Okay. Wow. Still. Neat. <laughs> Everything helps, you know? Right. So that's... It's, this message of love and quality music to a larger audience worldwide, so... You're still doing that? Are you still active with your music music career or are you still? Yeah, there? I'm writing a new album now. Oh, great. Um, and uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, I'm like uh, art beat poetry, you know, where you just sort of read poetry, but you do it either to a rhythm or to a, a background music thing. Okay. So I'm doing a lot of, I'm writing some art beat uh, dulcimer tunes. Right. And I'm writing a dulcimer suite, and uh, but I don't go out and tour anymore. In fact, I rarely perform. Uh, Live I, I'm anyway. Playing more on YouTube because I I, I hit thousands and thousands of more viewers than right. I do out on the road. Yeah, and you're in your house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's <laughs> that's cool. If I do go out and tour, it's. There has to be a tour date put together, but it's expensive to go out these days. And right. the whole industry is different now than it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the clickbait. And like, it's almost like I know a lot of artists think of their um, music as like marketing. It's like, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's like, I want to sell t shirts and everything else. Yeah. You have to. Well, that's the only way to make money is merchandise, but you have to be on. Instagram and TikTok and all that. I'm I'm not I'm not uh, interested in that anymore. That was a, a different. I I I pushed a career which was pretty I think successful, especially for a folky kind of. Um, yeah. I uh, I made decent money. I invested it wisely. You know, uh, it did well until the market crashed and then it didn't. Um, mm. But you know, looking back. I don't know where I had the energy to do all that because it was hard. Right. So what I do now is, you know, when someone says to me, Oh, you know, you're, I just had a guy, I mean, 
you know, I'm not boasting, but he said, you're one of the best dulcimer players out there. You should be doing these dulcimer festivals. It's like, I can't be bothered. Right. It's, I don't, right, you right, know, right. You're not identifying with that guy well, anymore. I don't want to deal with the airports. I don't want to deal with being underpaid. I mean, for me to go out, I have to leave here. I got to find someone to watch my dog. Right. And I tell the people who are booking these festivals what I charge. Oh, that's the, that's the budget of our entire festival. I said, then, okay, I won't <laughs> well, have to come. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. And they say, well, you're going to bring in the kind of ticket sales? I said, I'm not bringing in anything. If you want me, that's my fee. If you, I'm an expensive date. If you don't want me, that's okay, too. Right. I'm all right with all of that. Right. It's a great place to be, you know? <laughs> yes, because you're calling your shots and you're living life on your own terms. Yeah, and there's a folk song society thing around here that I do once or twice a year, and I don't, right. I don't make much money, but I love the venue. Right, right. The and it's, it's close to home. Yeah, it's close to home, and I love it. And, um, I mean, if someone said, well, you know, because Dulcimer is becoming really more and more popular in Europe, if they said, well, would you come to our festival in Paris, you know, we'll, we'll fly you out and pay you a little bit of money, not much, but we'll put you up and have show you a good time. I'd probably hop a plane. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's Paris. <laughs> yeah. But my career is more of, of the life coachy kind of thing. And, um, I don't like the term life coach, but it, it's as, a, as a teacher and things like that. I mean, 83,000 views on YouTube. Where am I going to find that kind of an audience? Right. Right. You know, and you didn't even get out of your chair. Right, so I didn't get out of my chair. <laughs> I'm doing a new video uh, ne- tomorrow, in fact, for the channel, and it's I'm doing a dulcy meditation. Okay. So I'm playing the instrumental, and the theme of it is uh, wake up in the morning, have some gratitude, and set an intention that you're going to have a pretty good day. That's basically the, the theme of it. Right. And I want them to spend five minutes watching this video or listening to this video with your eyes closed. You, everyone can find five minutes. Right. And uh, just, you know, chill out. So it's going to be a five-minute music thing. And I'm curious to see how many clicks I get. Because if they like it, they got to go back and watch it. Right. And watch it and watch it and watch it. Right, right. So um, I was going, you can make a lot of money on YouTube if you monetize it with commercials. But what I found out, people don't like to watch those little commercials. Right. So I just put a donation button. But okay. This, you know, yeah, at this point, I'm just kind of playing with things and... Right. No, I get where, it. But I can't find a larger audience and, you know, where, where I'm at, uh, staying home. But there may come a time when I want to tour. Depends if I want to go there. That, you know, it's like totally. someone invited me to Northern California. And, you know, oh, we don't have much money. And, you know, we it's a house concert. But I, I really want to get up there because of um, Yosemite and things like that. Sure. So it's about a three-hour drive from there. And I said, okay, I'll come. There, there you go. Yeah. So if you've got a, a reason other than you need a, a reason to get out of your chair there yeah, uh, or the house, you got to. Well, yeah, there's gotta a lot of a, work. It's got to be another reason besides I have a new album and I'm out there promoting it. I don't right, care. Right. Yeah. People right. don't buy that stuff much. Any, although they're starting to buy albums, but um, they download everything. So yeah, exactly. When I was in the business the way I was. Oh, you know, I was selling CDs, cassettes, albums, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it was, it was great, you know, so. It's a completely you know. different world now, the music business. I don't even get it. <laughs> no, I don't either. Yeah. So I stick with the music and I, I'm not much into the business. I mean, I own all my stuff. I, you know, it's copyrighted and I'm supposed to get royalties and I get little payments from CD Baby, who's my distributor. And oh, I know Derek. <laughs> well, I know Derek. He doesn't know me. <laughs> Derek, Derek got a good little run there. Yeah, he did. So, but basically, I think in a nutshell is I do what I want to do. I've arranged my life to be that way. So right. how, how did I do that? Let's let's look at that. Okay, sure. sure. I know we're coming to the end of the show. So I found um, when I was in many years ago, Maybe ten years ago, I was in major credit card debt. Sure, major credit card debt, like eighty thousand. You, you're you were you were in good company then because there's right. a lot of Americans in lots yeah. of credit card debt. So here's what I did: I went to an attorney. Yeah, and I, said, I don't want to go bankrupt, 
and he settled the credit card debt for 50%. Wow. So Thirty thousand. Yeah. So there are attorneys that do that. They call their credit card company. Back then, I don't know what they're doing now. Right. And I was left with 40000 And then I called the credit card companies. How much did you have to pay the lawyer? Does he get a cut or something? How's he getting paid? Four or $500. I don't remember. Really? Wow. He was in Kansas. Okay. Amazing. But I called the credit card company. I'm telling you this to help people who are listening to this. I called the credit card company and I said, look, I can't pay your your $500 a month, but I can pay $200 a month. And they said, well, that's not going to work. I said, well, then I'll go bankrupt. Do you want $200 or do you want nothing? And they said, all right, well, we're going to freeze your credit card. Good. You're not allowed to spend another dime, and we're going to make your payment at 232 a month. And if you miss one payment, you're going to be hung on the cross. I said, okay. Right. I didn't want any more credit cards. Right. So Good it took call. me years, a couple of years, three, four years to pay down my debt. I have two credit cards now with nothing on them. I have Good to buy a stamp to keep them open. And then I went into, I found the cheapest apartment that was decent. And then when I got to 55, over 55, there are retirement communities. Right. Part of these communities that exist out there are part of them are Section 8. And I, I, that's in California. I don't know if it's around the country. Okay. But Section 8 is for um, people who don't make a lot of income. Okay. So the way they, they get around it is the builders get a big, big tax break if they have Section 8 housing. Okay. But they can also have normal housing within the community. Okay. It just has to oh. include some Section 8 housing. Yes. Okay. Same same quality, but it's just Section 8. They give you a discount. Right. So I moved into a retirement community, and, you know, in Section 1 of this community is Section 8, which you couldn't tell the difference because it's the same kind of apartments. Right. And I'm in Phase 2, which is the normal kind of thing, but the price is, is pretty cheap. Right. Nice. And then the next thing I did is I set up a corporation. Well, I had a corporation. Okay. And my corporation makes the money and I don't make any, I pay a salary. Oh, so wow. I, okay. So your I corporation provided, pays you a salary. Okay. So I qualified for Medicaid and I qualified for food stamps. I qualified for those things legally until I got on and I didn't need them. So I didn't really use them, but I qualified. Right. For them. right. And then when I hit social security that, you know, basically paid for all of that stuff. So my living expenses are really minimal. Minimal, right. And um, I don't have any credit card debt. I don't have any stress financially. Um, That's great. Just being it, it, debt free is, is, is an amazing feeling. What you're doing really is, to me, it's more about being stress free, right? You're, yeah, living happy. Yeah, because yeah, if you living, have stress, yeah. you get sick. You get sick. Totally. So and if here, you're constantly you, worrying about money, yeah. Yeah. So here's how I work as a life coach. So I have a client who has had a lot of credit card problems. In the first couple of sessions, we talked about why emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. And I told him he needed to call these lawyers or call these people. or, And he kept putting it off. And then we would discuss, okay, why? And what's the block? That, and then finally, by the third session, I said, okay, enough of this bullshit. Because I do my sessions on Zoom. So right. you're going to pick the, the, the cell phone, and we're going to get it done now. Right. Well, I so don't that's know. the I said, thing oh. that, that a therapist will never do. No. <laughs> I said, enough, I said, enough of this bullshit. I'm going to save you $7,000 in interest a year, but you're going to go through this now. Right. So pick it up, and I'm going to tell you what to say. And then at the end of the session, he it worked out. And he said, oh, that was easy. Yeah. So that's what I'm like as, as a as a coach as i say look nothing wrong with that no that there's works. a scary monster under your bed until you turn the light on and it disappears right totally yes and count your blessings totally so let's talk about how people can best uh experience more kevin roth we already know kevin roth dot org or org uh, you are obviously on YouTube. Is there anything else you want to mention before we yeah, just, wrap just it go up? To my web, go to my website and it'll tell you how to reach me and what I do. And Check out uh, the uh, the guru. The guru videos yeah, are amazing. <laughs> He's guru awesome. Awesome. So describe that just briefly. It's a puppet. You're a off puppet. screen. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And he, uh, he talks about, um, he makes fun of things. I love so, it. 
he did. I did a thing on him with cell phone etiquette. Okay. And how people don't answer their cell phones, and they don't, and people text. So they, he says things like, you know, people break up with people through a text. You know, what kind of bullshit is that? And, <laughs> you know, things like, well, I, he'll say, um, I'll do his voice a little bit. He says, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he's talking about uh, that he has left um, a message or a text with someone he knows and he hasn't heard back for two days. So he'll say something like, uh, you know, you'll say that you need to decompress. <laughs> You don't need to decompress. You don't answer your cell phone for two days. You need a psychiatrist. <laughs> That's what he does. I want more of the of the guru. He's <laughs> he's very I, humble. Yeah. So a friend got pissed off at me because I was talking about her. I said it wasn't just you I was talking about. So yeah, so I come up with funny little things uh, about about life experience and. And things like that. Yeah. He kind of reminds me of a less filthy version of that insult dog that uh, Conan O'Brien <laughs> did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so good on you, Kevin Roth. This has been a blast. Thank you for being you and uh, sharing uh, this shared dream yeah. illusion with me for about an hour. <laughs> it was fun. Veering. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and veering. You Don't forget the veer. The veer is the key. <laughs> Thank you, brother. This has been a blast. Don't hang up yet, right, thanks. but I'm going to stop recording. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Vroom Vroom Veer.